But look what the rollback just dropped off. It's a beautiful 1970 satellite convertible. And it's here because Jim, the owner, is having Kiwi redo some not so hot body work that was done by the previous owner out back. And we'll look at all of that in a minute. But before it heads off the Kiwis, he wants to get it running. The car, it has a running problem. He's already fired the parts cannon at it. So now we're going to figure out exactly what's going on. And we'll talk about that at the end of the video. But for right now, I want to do my best Steve Magnanti imitation and do a walk around and talk about the unique features of the 1970 Plymouth B bodies and the things that make a convertible unibody, a convertible Chrysler product different than the standard hardtop or sedan. So, the 1970 Plymouth is a one year only body style. Typically Chrysler runs their, their bodies in two year, you know, two year runs. You've got the 66, 67 B bodies, the 68, 69s, the 71, 72s, the 73, 74, which look similar to the 71, 72, but they're different. But the 1970 Plymouth is all by itself, which makes finding parts for these cars very difficult. But in a lot of people's opinions, and I might be one of them, this is the high water mark of Mopar high performance styling where even the low performance cars look like they're they're just angry and like ready to fight ready to brawl and smooth sleek so this was the transition in the b-body line to the fuselage styling which Chrysler started introducing into their full-size cars in 1969 so that's that that sweeping you know curved sleek aircraft type of thing so what they did here was it's a one year only body but it is based on the 68-69 the A pillars the top or the roof and the C pillars are the same the door skins are the same as the 68-69 but everything else is different we start at the front so you can see, you really see if you look at it you can see the 71-72 in the nose of this thing they went with that like gaping mouth, like aircraft fighter jet sort of nose, but without the loop bumper that they added in 71. The 68-69 is much more conventional. It's uh, conventional for its time. It's much boxier. And it has a lot of angles to the front of it. You know, it, it, it cuts in and cuts out and cuts in, cuts out. The bumper has a lot of different shapes to it. This is much cleaner, straight across the gaping mouth I mean it looks mean it looks like it's ready ready to attack muscle car Chrysler muscle car styling I mean they, they really nailed it here so on the the Belvedere and the satellite the base models you have a flat hood like this on the Roadrunner and GTX they had people think of the cowl induction hood as a Chevy thing and the functional cowl induction hood is a Chevy thing but Chrysler incorporated a non-functional cowl induction scoop into this Roadrunner and GTX. So it's, it's, a, it's a, like a power bulge that ends at the back. Usually the displacement, the engine displacement is displayed back here. And the turn signals, like sometimes they have the, the fender mount turn signals. On those cars they put them at the back of the scoop. And it was non-functional. If you wanted like a ram air air grabber, then you had that trap door that opened up in the center. But people think of the cowl hood as being exclusively a Chevrolet thing or a General Motors thing. And it's not. The, it wasn't a real cowl hood, but it was a cowl hood nonetheless. And it looks right on this body. So the tops of the front fenders are the same as 68, 69, but the sides are different. Same basic contour, but the 6869 has this crease that runs over the top of the wheel opening like this, front to back. It breaks it up, where this is much smoother, much sleeker. The doors, the door skins are a carryover from the 6869. No differences there. Uh, of, of course, is where they move the, the, the lock knob and 68 was back here. 69 and 70, it's up here. But it's just that's the regular B body door. The rear quarter panel. So just like the front, they eliminated the crease that's on the 6869 cars that goes over here. And then on the 6869s, this is just a flat slab. 
and on these they incorporated this scoop. It doesn't do anything, but it looks like it does. It looks like it's got purpose to it, doesn't it? So that's for 70. Overall, it just cleans up the side of the car. And on the convertible, I was just looking at it well, we, before we were ready to film. I was just looking at it. The convertible really shows off the, uh, the curvature, the top of the quarter. You know? You, you can see it's just very sleek, very sexy. You now it's got hips. Now if you come around the back of the car, my opinion, this is the best view of these cars. The back of it is just beautiful. So again, like on the 6869, they had a lot of shapes going on. So the taillights cut in like this, and you got the, uh, the trunk lid is kind of rounded and bulged out a little bit. And then the taillights cut out again, and the bumper's got all kinds of shapes to it. Where well, this is just clean straight across. The 6869 has the trunk lid just comes straight down to here. You know, it's one piece. Where on the 70, it's less convenient, but the trunk lid opens from here, and this all stays in place. Also, they incorporated this like spoiler into the back of it. It's not really a spoiler, but it's a. I think they used to call this like a cam back. But again, it's like muscle car styling for the standard car. Nice, the back of these things, in my opinion, is the best view of, of the whole thing. And they mimicked that styling in the front with the trim in the back here like this. Just, just, it's just beautiful. It's just beautiful. So, going inside the car, Chrysler made a lot of changes from 1870. Not all of them were, were that good. So, for openers, you notice that the, uh, the glove compartment opens from the top down. As opposed to the earlier cars that flip open like this. But you also notice that it sounds a little chintzy when you open and close it. Because in 1969, 68, 69, these pads were all actually padded vinyl. You know, very soft and, and, and sound deadening where these things are just a hard molded plastic that tend to like vibrate and make a little noise as you're going down the road. But, you know, you can't have everything. You, I remember these cars, every one of these cars back in the day used to have like match, matchbooks and, and pieces of cardboard stuffed in different locations to keep all of the stuff from vibrating. Uh, the radio. So, 1968-69, they had that beautiful thumb wheel radio, 70. They cheapened it up a little bit and just went with conventional knobs. So the gauge clusters on these cars is something to talk about. 68-69, the Roadrunner, all of the Plymouth B-body models, Belvedere, Satellite, Roadrunner, and GTX, all had the same sweep-style speedometer. The only difference being that the GTX, instead of reading to 120, read to 150. But they were all the same. The alternator gauge, the gas gauge, temperature gauge, and in here went your optional tack or clock. And this one has nothing. In 1970, they split it up. The base models, the Belvedere and the Satellite, came with the sweep style speedo like this. But the Roadrunner and GTX had the Charger gauge cluster in it, the rally gauges. Which has got the two big pods here and then the four smaller ones there. Here's some completely unrelated trivia, having nothing to do with this car at all. On the Dodge side of things, if you ordered a Super B, a Super B automatically came with the Charger gauge cluster, but if you ordered an RT, it came with the sweep style like this, and you had to special order the rally gauges in that car. Like, just trivia. Okay. Back to this thing. 1970, they moved the key to the steering column. It used to be over here. But they moved it to the steering column because it was a theft-proof thing and the feds mandated that every car had to have a steering lock. So that's why the key ended up over here. Um, what else on the interior of this car? Not much else. The convertibles have a special back seat. It's much narrower than the original, than the, uh, the hardtop seat because it has to make room for all the mechanisms of the convertible top. So these things are really hard to come by. And of course it has the special side panels, which these things are in exceptional shape. You never see them this nice. They're always all beat up, but this stuff is in really good condition. All right, so 
Oh, and the steering wheel. So this steering wheel is not the original one to the car. This is actually is very similar to the 1967 recall wheel. So Chrysler put this wheel out in 1967, and they had to recall it because it was like it was, they called it like the guillotine wheel. People would get their fingers stuck. In these, in these slots and it would like cut the top the tips of their fingers off so they recalled those wheels and they replaced them with the wood spoke rally wheel that everybody's familiar with now but i tell you it, it makes a good appearance but the owner of the car is looking for the original style to put in this thing so those are the interior parts that make a convertible different than a hard top or a sedan what about the structural stuff so you guys are familiar with torque boxes they're usually associated with 426 Hemi cars. So all Hemi cars from 1966 to 71 had torque boxes, along with all 446 pack cars. Uh, um, not the 69s, 69s didn't have them, but 70 and 71 did. And 70 and 71 340 dusters also had torque boxes. But the torque box wasn't originally intended for high performance cars. They added the torque boxes on those cars to reinforce the pad that the leaf spring pushes against. The original purpose of the torque box was to tie the subframes together a little bit tighter on a convertible. So here, here. So here's the torque box in its natural habitat. And the purpose of this thing is to tie the two rear subframes to the rockers a little stiffer to match the stiffness of the outer rocker on a convertible. So here's the difference between a hardtop and a convertible. As you know, on a unibody car, or at least on these cars, you've got the two rear subframes. You got a bulkhead that goes across. Then you've got the rockers, and the rockers become the outer frame rail. You come forward, and there's another cross member, and then two more subframes. So the center section of the car is only supported by the rocker. Now on a hard top, the roof becomes a major structural component. That's what keeps the car from going like this. Take the roof away and this section of the rocker is the only thing keeping the car from, from doing this or this. So on the convertibles what they did was they added a piece of steel inside the rocker. It's not on Hemi cars or any of the other cars that have torque boxes, only the convertibles. So there's an extra piece of steel inside the rocker. And that's why they needed the torque boxes on these things. Because the rocker on these are so stiff, you needed a little bit extra beef to keep those, to keep the frame rails and the rockers all, you know, from, from moving around and fatiguing and cracking. And that's the purpose of the torque boxes on these cars. It also has a front torque box. So let's talk about the history of this particular car. Jim, the owner, it's been in his family since it was new. And he remembers back when he was like, when the car was new and he was a little kid going for rides in it. It's a northern car. So it's got some rot. I'll show you that in a second. But it went from family member to family member and it finally ended up in his hands recently. And he's had problems getting it running. It's going to Kiwis for the bodywork. So you see here, it was done, the bodywork on this car was done back in the 80s or so. You know, before it was before it was really worth something. So there's a lot of plastic in here. The drop-offs are rotted. Kiwi's gonna make all of that brand new. And uh, I mean, other than that, the car is, I mean, the floors, the frame sections, all of the important things are in beautiful condition. Uh, the wheels. So the owner just put these wheels on it. Now, for you eagle-eyed trivia freaks, you'll notice right away that that's a Ford rim. So how do you know it's a Ford rim? Well, this is a 15-inch Magnum 500, and it's chrome. So only Fords had 15-inch Magnum 500s. They were 15s by 7s. And only Fords had a chrome rim. The Chrysler Magnum 500s were all 14-inch. They were 14 by 6. And the only chrome Magnum 500s that were ever on Chrysler products were in 1967 when they were introduced and early 1968. And then from that point forward, the rim part of it was just plain steel and they used a chrome trim ring on them. So these are Ford rims, but they look perfect on here. You know, only a trivia bug like me would even notice something like that. It's the perfect rim, the perfect size for this car. It's flawless. So, it's here because since he got it, he's had a hard time, he's, he's not a mechanic, 
he likes he likes to work with stuff but he doesn't really know these cars very well and since he's gotten it he's had problems with it running it'll sometimes start it'll just drop dead he won't be able to restart it he's already fired the parts cannon at it so it's got the 318 that it was born with somebody undercoated this isn't black remember all chrysler products are supposed to have body color under here and his plan is to remove all of this undercoating and get it back to the body color uh actually he's going white with the car he's going like with an alpine white and this car originally had a burnt orange interior which is just beautiful and he's going to restore it to that whole burnt orange thing he's got some some plans for this car but he wants to leave it stock and drivable he wants just that that smooth, clean, happy, daily driver type of vibe to the car. So it's going to stay with the 318. Like I said, he's had a lot of problems with this thing, keeping it running. It's had, this is like the fourth distributor he's had in here. He's had a couple of carburetors. This is one of those uh, Chinese BBD knockoffs. And as it sits right now, the car came here on, a, on, a, on the back of a rollback. And my, our mission is to get this thing running. So like when I was in 1970, when this car was new, when I was eight years old, all the kids, they wanted to be like astronauts and like G.I. Joe guys and, and sports ball figures. And I wanted to be in the Plymouth troubleshooting contest. And they did this every year where they would take 50 Plymouths and each of them would have seven problems. And they, they put these cars in a field and there's a bunch of high school kids and they worked as teams and they had to figure out all of the problems with the car and get it to start and drive out of there. And that was like, that was my dream. I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to grow up and be in the Plymouth troubleshooting contest. And these are the cars that they used. So that's what we're going to do with this next. Tomorrow, we're going to go through this thing and we'll start going through it and try to find the bugs that keep eluding. Because evidently there's more than one. He's tried all different things. Like I said, the parts cannon has been fired at it and uh, the problems persist. So there's probably more than one bug at work here, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to figure out exactly what it is. And, uh, and that's it. We'll pick this up tomorrow or the next day and start picking through it and figure out exactly what we got to do to make this thing run as good as it looks. And that's it. The 1970 Plymouth Satellite Convertible. I love this car. I just love this car. I'll see you tomorrow.